Ladies and gentlemen, the following review is likely going to be disturbing and controversial for quite a few people. There will probably be very few jokes, if any, told in this review, and I can't guarantee that many of them will be funny. Merely vain attempts at levity for a very serious situation. This review is not being made for entertainment purposes, as is usually the case on TV Trash. But it's one that has to be made. Because this is a review about a movie that people need to be reminded of. It's a movie of huge, significant impact that many people in recent generations might not comprehend the magnitude of that impact, and thus need to be shown it firsthand. Because this is a movie that truly changed the course of history. This is the movie that, for all intents, ended the Cold War. In order to fully understand just how significant and important this movie is, you need to know the real-world events that were transpiring at the time it was made. The early 1980s had the closest scare to full nuclear war the world had seen in 20 years. We had dodged a huge bullet with the Cuban Missile Crisis, but after Ronald Reagan's election in 1980, a coalition of scientists and defense officials that included names like Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and Paul Wolfowitz assumed control of the USA's defense strategy and pressed hard for nuclear arms buildup. These people attempted to spread the propaganda that nuclear war was not only inevitable, but winnable. With even FEMA declaring the country could recover and rebuild from a nuclear attack within just a few years. The US began plans to move warships closer to Soviet territories and the Russians responded with Operation Ryan, a heavy alert system to look out for anything that might be interpreted as a U.S. or NATO strike against them. On September 26, 1983, they came very close to sounding the alarm as a radar bunker outside Moscow picked up blips thought to be incoming missiles. It was only because the bunker officer in charge that night, Stanislav Petrov, correctly guessed that there were too few blips for it to be an actual missile strike and defied orders by not relaying the report up the chain of command that any of us are likely around today. Petrov would rightfully be labeled years later as the man who saved the world. On November 2nd, NATO kicked off their most intricate war game ever, Able Archer, which was enough to make the Kremlin have long-range bombers on standby for a possible strike on West Germany. So it was in all of this that The Day After premiered on ABC on November 20th, 1983. The movie was directed by Nicholas Meyer, who had just made Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and was originally planned to be a four-hour event airing commercial-free over two days. However, following months of squabbling and post-production that included Meyer temporarily leaving the project, the network ultimately settled on a runtime of 120 minutes that would air in one night, which was close to what Meyer originally wanted. The movie received heavy motion for months before its airing, with ABC distributing half a million viewers guides warning of the graphic nature of the film's content and discussing the dangers of nuclear war. The result was a viewership of between 80 to 100 million people, or roughly half the American population that existed in that year. To this day, the day after maintains the highest television rating of any made-for-TV movie ever. The ultimate impact of the film? We'll get to that in the end, but for now, we take a look at The Day After. The movie opens with military personnel being flown from SAC Airborne Command Post in Omaha to the nuclear missile launch facilities in Kansas. We're shown a number of overhead shots of America's heartland to a musical score that is much more upbeat than what might expect given the ultimate events that will take place here. But that's very significant because while most of us are probably aware of what is going to happen in this movie, and likely a lot of those who watched the original airing knew, the fact is, this music helps drive home the point that none of the characters we are about to meet currently know. 
We're then taken to Kansas City, where we are soon introduced to Dr. Russell Oaks, who clearly has a lot on his plate. Not only is he scheduled to teach a hematology class at the University of Kansas, in addition to his regular hospital duties in Kansas City, but he has to deal with the shocking news that his daughter is moving away to Boston. It was really hard for him to come to terms with just how much of a Red Sox fan she really was. We also meet Airman First Class Billy McCoy, who is preparing for a month-long furlough in New Orleans. And then two farming families that live to the southeast of Kansas City, the Dahlbergs, who are preparing for the oldest daughter Denise getting married, and the Hendries, whose farm is bordering the missile launch site where Airman McCoy is currently working. Now, for the record, this was not intended to be a star-studded movie. You're going to see faces that you will likely recognize, like John Lithgow, Steve Gutenberg, and William Allen Black, but none of these people were established stars at the time this movie came out. In fact, this movie likely aided the advancement of their careers. Nicholas Meyer relented to casting one name actor to help the movie eventually sell in Europe, and he selected Jason Robards, when the two happened to be on a plane together. But overall, the producers intentionally went against big-name actors because they didn't want them drawing attention away from the movie's story and message. That's also important because these characters are supposed to be people that we can look at and see ourselves, our family, friends, and neighbors in. And it's also important that at no time will we see the President of the United States or any other people who would be directly responsible for what ultimately is about to happen here. This movie is about these random citizens in a portion of the country that few people take that much stock into. And everything they are doing at this time would seem superfluous in the big picture, but these events they are planning mean everything to them. And at the start, they are oblivious to events controlled by others that will greatly affect them. In fact, the first scene after the opening credits was at the Kansas City Board of Trade, where we hear no voices from the extremely busy crowd within the building, only that of the TV talking about the Soviets advancing forces along their western borders and the Soviet ambassador ridiculing the U.S.'s condemnations because of their own nuclear arsenal. The fact that we hear nothing from the people is a way of showing how they are not paying attention to the news reports at this time, indicative of how no one right now can fathom how the events going on at this time are starting the course of events of what will ultimately come to pass. Only a small handful, like one of McCoy's fellow airmen, have any feelings that something is going on. But eventually, as more reports come out, like hearing that the Eastern Bloc has blocked off access to West Berlin completely, some begin to get more concerned, like Dr. Oakes and his wife, who had previously been worried that their daughter was leaving just because of a crush on some guy, and Farmer Dahlberg, who becomes so worried about the situation that he can't even get too upset about Denise engaging in premarital hanky-panky with her fiancé. That alone should tell you just how damn serious this is becoming. Do you remember Kennedy on television? Telling Bruce to turn his boats around. Full retaliatory response. He didn't bat an eye. He got up, went to the window, looked for the bombs. Didn't happen. It's not gonna happen now. Nah, people are crazy, but not that crazy. What if it does happen? What do we do? And Mrs. McCoy is definitely the most worried once her husband is among the military personnel to be on alert. At first, it looks like she's just upset that their vacation is being interrupted, but you eventually get the sense that she's really worried that something very bad is about to happen. The next day, as they all hear that situations are deteriorating in Europe further, people finally start seriously talking to one another. And it's here we start getting some very very important dialogue. There is a rumor they are evacuating Moscow. Yeah. There are even people leaving Kansas City because of the missile fields. Now I ask you, where does one go from Kansas City? To uh, the Yukon? To Tahiti? <laughs> we are not talking about Hiroshima anymore. Hiroshima was 
plus peanuts. Nah, what's a few extra thousand kilotons? Wait, you think they're making this up? You think this is War of the Worlds or something? Look, did we help the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Afghans, or the Poles? Well, we're not gonna nuke the Russians to save the Germans. I mean, if you were talking oil in Saudi Arabia, then I'd be real worried. <laughs> What do you really think the chances of something like that happening way the hell out here in the middle of nowhere? Nowhere? <laughs> There's no nowhere anymore. You're sitting next to the Whiteman Air Force Base right now. That's about 150 Minuteman missile silos spread halfway down the state of Missouri. That's an awful lot of bullseyes. This was grounded in truth, as Whiteman had indeed been a key missile launch base since 1961, home to 150 missile silos and 15 launch control centers. An interesting point that the United States would put such a launch base in the middle of the country rather than along the coast for closer range to a potential target, because they knew the base itself would be a target and chose to keep the highly populated East Coast coast out of that target area, showing little concern for the people who lived about in the heartland. Not that it would ultimately mean that much anyway. As Dr. Oakes struggles to contact his wife, he begins to make his way back home. While University of Kansas student Stephen Klein starts getting worried and tries to hitchhike back home to his parents. Of course, now is when the panic really starts to set in, as there are rushes at the grocery stores with no Dana Scully to yell at people to remain calm. And people are naturally told over the emergency broadcast system to head for shelter, even though there is no immediate threat to the area, which is certain to assuage any fears. Meyer actually got the idea to throw that little detail in after he actually interviewed members of FEMA to find out just what they were doing to help prepare the American public for a possible nuclear strike, and it turned out it only involved having evacuation routes published in telephone books, and even then, only for the Northeast, leading Meyer to eventually call FEMA a complete joke. Meanwhile, some people like the Hendry couple sneak off to have sex just as the news reports that the first wave of short-range missiles have been fired, either unaware of the report or in denial of the fact. While over at the Dahlbergs, we see one of the most gut-wrenching moments of the first half of this movie, as Mrs. Dahlberg refuses to accept what is going on and has to be carried kicking and screaming down into the basement. At the launch sites, officers are ordered to unlock the codes for the missile launches, and soon... Miniman missiles. They're on their way to Russia. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? Sure enough, as soon as the USA's harbingers of death are in the air, the military sees that ones from the Soviets are headed their way. It is very important to note that the movie never states which side fired first. Meanwhile, every innocent civilian, every airman who wasn't involved in the launch, can only watch the plumes of smoke heading upward, knowing it's the beginning of the end. I gotta get my wife and my kids. We're still on alert, Billy. No one leaves this facility. Oh, come Not on, until man. The who are you kidding? Are you kidding me, man? The bombs will be here before the choppers, Will. Listen. Damn. Listen to me, man. The war is over. It's over. We've done our job. So what are you still guarding? Huh? Some cotton picking hole in the ground, all dressed up and nowhere to go? As Dr. Oaks heads towards Kansas City, he sees the jam of traffic heading out the other way and can deduce what has happened. And then...
a nuclear weapon detonates, it unleashes an electromagnetic pulse which shuts down any power source within its blast radius. <laughs> refrigerators to hide in. Much of this scene at the end of the movie's first half used massive stock footage from actual ICBM tests as well as borrowing footage from other disaster movies. The result is more than two minutes straight of death and destruction, but not in a way that's exciting and cool like some Japanese kaiju movie. This becomes some of the scariest footage imaginable because it comes off as all too real. Now, the remainder of this movie, a full hour of its runtime, originally aired with no commercial interruption. This was not as difficult a decision for the network to make as you might think, because what was very hard was selling ad time for the movie. But the end result would be profound. There would be no shilling of Coca-Cola, McDonald's, or ColecoVision systems to take the viewers, even for a few minutes, out of the seriousness and gravity of what all comes next. At the university, Professor Huxley tries to construct a radio in the hopes of contacting anyone outside, while others try to measure the level of radiation outdoors, needing car batteries to do all of this because there is still no power anywhere. Dr. Oakes eventually makes it to the one place that would be natural to him, the University Medical Building, which is already being overflowed with people suffering from severe burns and other injuries. Stephen finds his way to the Dahlberg Farm, one of the few instances where people from separate groups that we've seen do come together, and he tells them of how many bombs he saw go off, essentially telling them that pretty much every place with a silo was hit. And we see that McCoy protected himself from the blast by shutting himself up in a large steel box. No, I already referenced that Indiana Jones bit once. I wonder who was spared. I wonder if New York, Paris, Moscow. Just like Kansas City now. At first, there is naturally panic and confusion. Denise Dahlberg loses it from realizing her fiance is likely gone and runs outside, oblivious to Stephen trying to tell her that she's breathing in radiation right now. Huxley points out that it won't be safe outside until the radiation drops below 2 rads per hour, but it's currently still at 50 and not getting lower because fallout is blowing in from other blast points. As Dr. Oakes and others try to think of options for restoring water and energy, even just to the hospital so they can treat the currently wounded, every option is shut down because some after effect of the blast rendered it useless. And Oakes realizes it's only going to get worse. When will it be safe to move people to other buildings? It'll never be safe. What do you think's gonna happen out there? You think we're going to sweep up the dead and fill in a couple of holes and build some supermarkets? You think all those people left alive out there are going to say, oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't my fault. Let's kiss and make up. We knew the score. We knew all about bombs. We knew all about fallout. We knew this could happen for 40 years. Nobody was interested. <laughs> 
When the Dahlbergs dare leave their home days later and attempt to attend church services, the preacher tries to say how this was God's act of destroying the wicked and sparing the righteous, but it's then that Denise starts developing radiation sickness, a fitting example of how the preaching has no meaning. With roughly a half hour to go in the movie, we finally get a radio message from the president. My fellow Americans, while the extent of damage to our country is still uncertain, and shall probably remain so for some time, preliminary reports indicate that principal weapons impact points included military and industrial targets in most sectors of the United States. There is, at the present time, a ceasefire with the Soviet Union, which has sustained damage equally catastrophic. Many of you listening to me today have suffered personal injury, sudden separation from loved ones, and the tragic loss of your families. I share your grief, for I too have suffered personal loss. During this hour of sorrow, I wish to assure you that America has <coughs> survived this terrible tribulation. There has been no surrender, no retreat from the principles of liberty and democracy for which the free world looks to us for leadership. But for everyone listening to the supposed words of comfort and patriotism, these words ring hollow. It is too little, too late, coming from one of the principles responsible for their suffering. The jingoistic ramblings of someone that is supposed to represent their country to the world, but who is really completely disassociated from the common American, and can never understand what the common people are going through right now. Farmers reject the claims of this movie's stand-in for FEMA, telling them to scrape off inches of topsoil in order to decontaminate for planting because they know how unrealistic that is. And when the representative talks about how it's now the farmer's responsibility to provide for the country at large in the wake of this catastrophe, this also falls upon deaf ears because they know it was the country that caused this catastrophe. People riot over hearing there aren't enough rations for everyone, leading to them getting shot. With each day, the bodies just keep increasing more and more. Everyone gradually comes to realize that every precaution they took to try and ensure their own survival, every attempt to try and rebuild, it will all amount to nothing. Back at the hospital, Dr. Oakes is being overcome with not just his own radiation poisoning, but the realization of just how many people are presently suffering. Oakes collapses, and just like he alluded to before, once his eyes close, he begins having flashbacks to his family, the last time he saw them all, and then the blasts that very likely took them from him. And eventually, knowing his own slow and painful death is inevitable, the doctor's only wish is to find out what happened to his home and his family. As he hitches a ride back to Kansas City, the last shot we get from Lawrence is of inside Allen Fieldhouse, one of the most storied college basketball arenas in the country, here littered with countless humans. Every one of them getting worse and worse with each passing day, each passing hour. Every one of them simply waiting, hoping for death to end their suffering. And it's here that you realize that all those that were vaporized in the blasts back at the midway point of this movie, they were the lucky ones. The doctor does indeed make it back to Kansas City, where we see the remains of the city's Liberty Memorial and its engraved message, words that now have no meaning. Oakes finds the remains of his home, now inhabited by squatters. Get out of my house. Didn't you hear me?
And with that, as the doctor likely succumbs to his own end, we get one final call from Professor Huxley on his radio, asking for a response that never comes. And the movie ends with this message that everything we just saw actually downplayed what would really happen as a result of nuclear war. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the day after. The most gut-wrenching, most depressing, most important TV movie ever made. Let me make this clear. I normally hate stuff like this. I prefer optimism and happy endings in forms of escapism like movies. But this was a story that needed to be told at the time it came out. The movie sends a message far more powerful than any Roland Emmerich disaster blockbuster and one that everyone needed to hear. Screw what we call reality TV today, this was reality TV. This, despite technically being a complete work of fiction, was totally grounded in reality. The reality of what could happen what would happen if we continued to go down the path we were headed. This is not a feel-good action-adventure post-apocalyptic movie where a small band of determined individuals survive on guts, togetherness, and a never-say-die attitude. This movie has no happy ending because in a real nuclear war, there would be no happy ending for anybody. There would be no winners, there would be no survival, there would be no rebuilding. There would be nothing but despair, devastation, and death for everyone. The impact was decisive and hard on the millions that watched this movie in 1983. 1-800-Hotlines were set up for people to call and get help for the depression they suffered from viewing this. But it's clear that was exactly what the creators wanted to do. The people, the United States, the world needed a huge dose of reality. The film was immediately followed by a special edition of the Roundtable Debate Show Viewpoint hosted by Ted Koppel. And in it, Carl Sagan had the perfect rebuttal to those who argued for nuclear deterrence and the growing arms race. Imagine a room awash in gasoline, and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches, the other 7,000 matches, and each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. Naturally, there was still heavy criticism of the movie from conservative pundits, with Ben Stein and the New York Post arguing that an America ruled by the Soviets would be worse than total destruction. But the movie made an impact on the one person that mattered most. Ronald Reagan got an advanced screening of the the film on Columbus Day, two weeks before he was briefed on the Able Archer War Game, and he freely admitted the movie depressed him greatly. This was far from the only medium that dared tackle this subject. 1983 also saw the German band Nena release 99 Luftballons, in which the English translation directly referenced nuclear war. In 1984, the BBC released the English equivalent to the day after Threads, while Dr. Seuss wrote the Butter Battle Book, which managed to parable the arms race as only his brilliant words could. When DC rebooted Wonder Woman in 1986 following Crisis on Infinite Earths, George Perez's first story arc centered on Ares trying to set events in motion to cause a nuclear war, until Diana showed him there would be nothing left but a dead planet and therefore no one for him to rule over. Even Weird Al Yankovic got into the act with the 1986 release of Christmas at Ground Zero, which used his own fighting wit to show how even something as poignant and traditional as the holidays would be meaningless in the event of nuclear war. The end result of all of this? In 1987, the same year that the day after first aired in the Soviet Union, the two superpowers signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which banned the use of short and intermediate range missiles. There's long been a rumor that Reagan sent a letter to Nicholas Meyer saying you caused this to happen in regards to the treaty. 
Meyer has since denied that actually happened, but to say the movie had absolutely no influence at all on this country's choice of actions thereafter would really be folly. More disarmament followed in the years after, and following the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty of 1991, the missile silos at Whiteman Air Force Base were completely removed by 1995. For years, it looked like America and the world had learned their lesson, and it all ties back to this movie. Unfortunately, it appears that lessons can be unlearned. In 2002, the United States backed out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty of 1972, and both sides have since been accused of violating the INF Treaty. Since then, we've seen more war games being used to try and intimidate those we are told are our enemies. People we are told would have no problem launching nuclear weapons at us should they get them with no fear of repercussions. And we are being made to believe once again Again, that constantly having our weapons stockpiled and armed at a moment's notice is the only way to be safe. Peace through intimidation and distrust, just like it was in 1983. And leaving some of us to worry if the third time won't be the charm if those people are not able to learn the lesson again. And yet another bizarre coincidence for this video series, it was as I was preparing to review this that the movie was brought back into the public light in a recent episode of the FX series The Americans. The episode tried to show what Americans felt as a result of watching the movie, but not even that might allow people to completely comprehend if they themselves have not seen it. Which is why I hope the copy of this movie currently on YouTube remains up there and everyone takes a look at it, or else you all find a copy somewhere to watch. In a time where it's beginning to look like global tensions are reaching their most strained in more than 30 years, the United States and the world just might need to see a production like The Day After Again to be reminded that the worst case scenario in these cases is one where nobody comes out a winner. Sometimes we need to go back to the past to help ensure that we have a future. Thanks for watching TV Trash.